welcome to another edition of America's Godly Heritage. So if it was at all possible, the darkness that was in North America when Columbus first arrived had become even darker. Those who were supposed to be bringing the good news to the indigenous peoples were instead exploiting them, brutalizing them, killing them, beating them, stealing all of their possessions. Yet, as I said, into this darkness we have the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and the Jesuits. They come. They're going to bring a big difference here because they are going to be very, very different from what I've just been talking about. And that difference is what's going to attract the people to them and to God. Now, person number two of interest, our case study here. This is Bartolome de las Casas. Now, if you saw the Christopher Columbus video, Bartolome de las Casas is mentioned there. He comes with Christopher Columbus on Columbus's third voyage to the New World. He actually works with Columbus to develop the Admiral of the Ocean Seas journal to keep it for posterity. So he gets to the New World, parts ways with Columbus, not in any bad sense, just He's got other things that he's supposed to be doing. And he goes on some expeditions. And as a reward for his participation in those expeditions, he's actually awarded an encomienda. Can you believe it? They're giving an encomienda, which is basically a slave situation, to a priest. For a couple of years, he's like, yeah, this is really cool. I'm making lots of money. This is great. And then he starts realizing, wait a minute, what's going on here? He starts really getting convicted in his heart about this is wrong. These people are being treated terribly. He really was most broken about the fact that he realized he was viewing the natives as animals almost or beasts of burden or things or numbers on a ledger rather than actual people. And that just so convicted him that he renounced his encomienda and he basically spends the rest of his life trying to get rid of this horrible system. He realizes it's useless to stay in the new world and try to tell people in Spain what it's like and to get changes to happen when the government's three, 4,000 miles away and he's here. So he realizes he's got to go back to Spain to do things in person because in person he can really make it real. It's not just a letter that somebody doesn't want to read so they can ignore it. So he returns to Spain in 1515 to plead for the people's better treatment. He becomes friends with the Archbishop of Toledo, and they develop a plan para la reformación de las Indias, which is the plan for the reformation of the Indies. Remember, they're still thinking that these are Indians, and, and this is the Indies. And it's a success, and they do get some measure of authority to go and start really looking at and starting to deal with what's going on back in the New World. They're going to investigate the status of the Indians and make reports on it. So if they've moved it into just rumor and speculation into we're making official reports on it, then they can make a difference because people are going to start having to acknowledge the truth. So he and his friends go back. They go all over the place in the Caribbean and Central America, and they investigate and they make reports about what they're seeing over there. And in the middle of all of this, around 1537, De Las Casas thinks, you know, I'd really like to not just write reports about them, but I want to work with my Dominican brothers to go and evangelize to some of the people that haven't yet been abused by the Spanish. I think a really good way of being able to work with them would be to befriend them, to learn their language and learn their customs and to show them the light of Christ through my own friendship, which sounds suspiciously like the Gantes, doesn't it? He does that. He and some other people come up with a system. They call it the Unico Moldo, the only way, and that outlines their method of evangelization. And then they go to an area in Guatemala. So surprise, surprise, De Las Casas' idea of evangelizing through friendship and through 
a gentle method as opposed to the forceful method, was successful. And a few years later, he goes back to Spain and he's working with King Charles V. And Charles is kind of humming and hawing because, yes, he's appalled by what's going on over in Spain, but also it's making him some money. So, uh, I don't know. But eventually, he is able to convince the king that this is just an evil that has to end. So, they pass what is called the New Laws in 1542. They alleviated a lot of the terrible conditions that the natives were working under, just making it more bearable, less abuse going on. It also made it a way that the next generation of people that would come up through the encomienda systems would be free. So it kind of allowed the encomienda system to die off with a generation and slowly work its way out. However, de las Casas wasn't quite so happy about that. So when he went back to the new world, he had a plan. And what he did was he would tell the people who he worked with, like not his other Dominicans, but the people who would come to Mass and the people who he would hear their confessions or he would go to their deathbeds and listen to their confessions then and give them absolution of their sins. He would tell them, if you have people in encomienda, I am not going to absolve you. That meant that they would not be forgiven of their sins and they would go to hell because they had people in encomienda. So this pressure of, you're gonna to go to hell for your sins, meant that a lot of people decided, well, maybe they could give up the people who were in encomienda sooner than they had been expecting to because they were in fear for their immortal souls. So that definitely worked, especially when he was the Bishop of Chiapas in Guatemala. He did continue to send reports back to the king and as he got older, he did go back and stay in Spain for the last few years of his life as an advisor to the king. He spent a lot of that time doing his very best to show the Spanish court the evil of the arrogance, the why do you think Spanish culture is superior to the native culture? It's different, yes. It is definitely different from the indigenous people's cultures, but it's not necessarily better. So he's really pushing against that tide of trying to get them to understand that just because they're Spanish, just because they're European, just because they have superior weapons doesn't make them superior in themselves and in their culture. It's just different. He took a lot of what he remembered in his reports and his own personal experiences, and he wrote this book called Historia de las Indias, The History of the Indies. He knew it would be an explosive book because it just really laid out a ton of the abuse and just the horrific things that were going on in the New World that the Spanish were perpetuating. And it did indeed have a massive explosion in Europe. People were just horrified and they couldn't believe how awful the Spanish were. So the Spanish had a massive loss of face, loss of pride just so damaged them in the international community because of this behavior being exposed. So Bartolomé de las Casas, who was given the title Protector of the Indians, did indeed do his best to champion their cause through his missionary work, his influence in the royal court, and in his writings. Okay, so now we're going to switch from Central America to California, and we're going to look at the life of Fray Junipero Serra. Serra was 36 years old when he decided he wanted to be a missionary to the New World. He crossed the ocean in 1749 with a bunch of other Franciscan monks. They became a relatively tight-knit group. When Serra eventually went on his walking tour to California to set up some missions, which we'll get to in a few minutes, a lot of these monks went with him. But in the meantime, they landed in Veracruz and they had to walk to Mexico City. And this is hundreds of miles. They had to walk. They don't have any other way of getting there. They don't have horses. They don't, can't afford that. So they have their feet. They walk. But anyway, the point is, as they're walking along this route, Serra gets a leg injury. For the rest of his life, he has issues with this leg. He has a lot of pain in this leg. And sometimes it is really hurtful for him to try to walk. Nevertheless, he walked somewhere around 6,000 miles in service to God. 
So he gets to Mexico City and they send him to the Native Americans in the Sierra Madre Mountains, which is along the west coast of Mexico. He does really well there. So then they send him to Monterey, which is sort of in the middle of Mexico. One of his friends, his name's Polo, becomes his biographer as well, because Polo just recognizes this guy's got a special touch, a special anointing on him, and people are just flocking to him. So he starts writing down stories of things that they encounter. So he's telling about Zeta's character, what he does, and also several times God directly intervenes in their affairs. In one story, I just found it a little amusing, so I'll share it with you. When he, meaning Seta, was traveling with a party of missionaries through the province of Huasteca, which is in Mexico, in the central area, many of the villagers did not go out to hear the word of God at the first village where they stopped. But scarcely had the fathers left the place when it was visited by an epidemic which carried away 60 villagers all of whom were persons who had not gone to hear the missionaries. The rumor of the epidemic having gone abroad, the people in other villages became very punctual in attending the fathers' meetings, and not only the villagers, but the country people dwelling on ranchos many leagues distant. And so the word went around, if you don't attend these meetings, you're going to die in this epidemic. So people are showing up in droves to listen to Sarah talk. When Sarah was 54 years old, King Charles III of Spain felt threatened by the fact that the Russians were up in Alaska, which is on the very tip of the west coast of North America. He was afraid that the Russians were going to come down because they had ships and they were going to work their way down the coast and start claiming all of that land for Russia. So he sent a group led by Sarah to go and found a bunch of missions along the coast of what is now California. So he did so, and he was able to found the first nine of 21 missions that ranged from San Diego up to San Francisco. There's roughly one every 30 miles. The Native Americans were attracted to the missions, in part because the missions provided them with a stable source of food, taught them practical skills, protected them from the Spanish soldiers, and gave them a higher quality of life. Those first nine missions that Sarah founded were responsible for 4,600 converted Native Americans when Sarah died. According to Palau, to Sarah, God was everything. His actions were governed by the ever-present and predominant idea that life is brief and that a person's soul is hovering between eternal perdition and salvation. He always wanted people to move into salvation so that they could spend eternity with God. And he greeted everyone with this saying, love God. And indeed, he was loved. He was loved by the Native Americans, the other friars, and even the soldiers that accompanied them. Everybody adored this man. Sera's motto was siempre adelante, which means keep moving forward. The many worn-out pairs of sandals, the missions he founded, and the people he impacted for Christ reflect that he truly lived his motto. Thank you for listening to this edition of America's Godly Heritage. I hope you have a great day. Bye! If you would like to help support America's Godly Heritage or to view the resources used to make this podcast, Just go to patreon.com or vimeo.com and type America's Godly Heritage in the search box. You can also make financial donations at givesendgo.com. Again, just type America's Godly Heritage in the search box. We really appreciate your support. Thanks again. Bye. (music) 